Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Top Two Inches of Sport podcast with me, Anthony Sheriff. This is a podcast about something that's always fascinated me, the mindset required to succeed in elite level sport. On this podcast, I'm going to talk to people who I really look up to in the world of sport and try to find out how they deal with the highs and lows that come with consistently striving for success in the unforgiving environment of elite sport. For the 30th episode of the podcast, I spoke to recently crowned Olympic rowing champion Fintan McCarthy. Fintan won gold in Tokyo alongside his teammate Paul O'Donovan in the lightweight double skulls event. At only 24 years of age, he's only been competing at senior level for the past couple of years and he's already achieved so much success in such a short period of time. Fintan explains the reasons behind taking up Rowan in the first place and he discusses the mindset that he's developed to be so successful at the very pinnacle of a sport. As a small country, we've been blessed with some great Olympians down the years and at only 24, Fintan's achievements have put him right up there with the very best of them. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the Top 2 Inches of Sport with Olympic rowing champion, Fintan McCarthy. Okay, there we go, we're recording now. So thanks a million for Fintan for uh, coming onto the podcast today. I'm gonna to talk to you about loads of different things. Like I wanna find out all about how you got into rowing and also the mental side of rowing because I don't really know a whole lot about the sport. But just to start off, I'm gonna ask you a question that you're probably sick of answering for the last couple of months, but I'll ask you anyway. How, uh, how mad has your life been since you became Olympic champion a couple of months ago? Yeah, it's it's uh it's been great. Like I can't complain. Uh, you know, there's so many uh like opportunities and stuff that have that have come up, and it's just been a roller coaster, really. You know, it's just one day, and then but just then everything that comes after is you're still getting used to it. You know, not not used to it yet, but yeah, yeah. it's been it's been really exciting. Yeah, I'd say it is very hard to process because obviously you're still very young. Wait, you're 25, is it? 26, 24. 20, yeah. geez, 20, 24 like so again like you said it was only one day but nobody will ever ever be able to take that away from you for the rest of your life you're someone who's won won the olympic game so i mean is it is it almost a bit weird yeah uh a bit surreal you know like you've kind of imagined it so many times and you're like planning it and of course uh you know we had the extra the extra year as well so yeah. it was nearly a case of god is it ever going to come around so when it happens then it's it's kind of yeah it's a bit surreal you it's like yeah it's bad yeah i can imagine uh so we will get on to the olympics later on there's plenty i want to ask you about that but just to find out a bit about yourself growing up first so obviously you've reached the absolute pinnacle of sport when you were growing up were you always a, a sport a young lad and did you give other sports a go yeah um to be honest not very sporty um uh like i did a few sports when i was younger you know the usuals like soccer and ga yeah. and stuff uh i just wasn't great though see my twin brother jay he was always kind of like the sporty one yeah. so he'd just be showing me up left right and center like whenever <laughs> we both went down to the to the gaa club or you know to soccer or whatever so it, I did a bit for a while when I was really young and then I don't know I kind of just eventually um eventually like I guess just stopped um especially kind of going into second year or secondary school mm -hmm. I didn't really have any sports and it wasn't actually until um I think like my junior cert year that I actually properly started rowing uh, we did in primary school. We did this. Uh, the club down Skibbereen have this kind of course where, like, fourth, fifth, and sixth class from different schools, different primary schools around the area, would like go in on a Friday, kind of as part of, I guess, as part of PE, and just uh, you know try out rowing a boat. And I remember at the time thinking it was great fun, and I think I might have went a few Sundays when I was younger but yeah I kind of just didn't come back to it really then until third year um I think it was just a case of like a bit of a last ditch attempt to like find something really because I had nothing like I was just going to school coming home and uh yeah I just wanted a bit more out of life I guess yeah yeah I get you yeah. so yeah so you obviously only started off for a little bit of fun with their own at what stage did you realize 
that you're actually very good at it? Like, was there a moment where you realized you might not have thought, oh, I can become an Olympic champion, but where you did think I can actually make a career out of a, out of Rome? Um, I don't know. Like, to be honest, it was quite early on where I knew that I enjoyed it because, mm. um, I think I just had a knack for like the technique, like it's quite a technical sport. So I picked, I picked that up quite early on and, you know, people would say, Oh, like you're actually good, which was like so different for me because <laughs> I was rubbish at everything else. So it was actually really nice when people, when people yeah. were saying I was good at something. So I think that kept me, kept me in there initially. Yeah. And it, you know, it's one of those sports as well that, like you can only get better by yeah. training and practicing like the work you put in is is what you get out of it so that was really kind of something new for me as well because um you know with with uh with soccer and football and stuff uh there wasn't like you know we went training maybe a couple of times a week now i did no serious yeah, our soccer, so I can't really talk. I can't really talk that much about it. But yeah. from what I saw from my brother doing a lot, he kind of like he was progressing away. But um, it was just nice for me to be able to see my progress, like in you know, in in times on the water and on the wrong machine. Like you know, you're getting better, which was yeah. good. I think. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You mentioned your your twin brother Jake there a couple of times. Am I right in saying he's a pretty high level rower himself? Yeah, yeah. Um, he had a pretty bad injury there. Um, kind of the start of the first lockdown. Really, he herniated a few discs in his back, so he's been out for ages. But yeah, he rode at a really high level. We went to we went to uh, a few under twenty three world championships together. Yeah, in the double, and we did a senior Europeans as well. So he's kind of getting back into the swing of things now. So hopefully your, we'll see him knocking yeah. around. Hopefully, yeah. What's your, not your, your brotherly relationship, but like what's your sporting relationship with Jake? Like, is it one, is there kind of a, like a healthy competitiveness where you're like, you know, that kind of iron sharpens iron where you're almost trying to outdo each other, but in the process, you're actually both pushing yourselves massively. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely very competitive. Um, <laughs> when it comes to training and stuff, we have a little, uh, we have a Google Sheets actually, where we log <laughs> all our training and, and add it up at the end of the week. So we yeah. see who's done more. So that's always uh, the main competition during the week really. But uh, I think it's healthy in, yeah, when it comes down to it, it's healthy. Like we definitely push each other on and give each other motivation. Like seeing him get through the past 10 months, you know, really helped me through training because like I had a grand all I had to do was train whereas he was battling this horrendous back injury like and still managing to train like on the bike or or swimming or running or on the cross trainer like he was doing anything he could just to keep fit so so yeah that put things into perspective a bit for me yeah how's he now physically yeah he's he's getting there you know he's um I'd say maybe 80 or 90 percent of the way there yeah. He still can't do like a full a full week's rowing, but he supplement it with you know like bike or or swimming and stuff like that. So he's very fit. Like we had we all raced um, at the national championships a few months ago, and he was really close to us in the single. So yeah, he definitely one to watch. Yeah, no, I'm probably going to get all of the rowing lingo totally wrong. Like some, I'm uh, I'm not very up to, <laughs> up to speed with my rowing, but so you're the double uh, double skull lightweight double skulls. That's what you yeah. want the Olympics and the World Championships, isn't it? But you've also yeah. competed solo, haven't you? Is that called single skulls or just single? Yeah, skulls? single skulls. Yeah. Skulls. Okay, so I think you, you you personally you got bronze in the Europeans only in 2020, only last year. So yeah, like yeah. Do do you prefer the doubles to the singles, or is it much of a muchness? Like, is there a massive difference? Yeah, I think, um, God, all boats are quite different, like, um, I guess, in the way you approach training and racing. Um, obviously, the race in the single is a bit longer, so um, there's that. You have to be really, like, fit and good technically as well. Um, and then, then in the double, you're with someone else, so, like, it's a different dynamic. Yeah. But they're both, they're both small boats, so they're not too dissimilar like when you get up to the eights and the quads you'd be rowing like a totally different style just because yeah. the boat's so much faster but yeah. um 
so like I would say it's a bit easier going from the single like switching between the single and the double than it is like a double to a quad or something like that but um, yeah there is definitely differences yeah and in the doubles because obviously that's what mo- most of the, the casual fans I suppose know you best from obviously <laughs> with, with uh, Paul O'Donovan there in the Olympics just gone so in the doubles is there much communication between the two of you? Because uh, obviously you can't have a full blown, full blown chat. But is there like moments where you're actually verbally communicating, like just giving certain signals, or what way does the communication work? Yeah. Um, so sometimes during a race, to be honest, we probably say a lot less than other crews would. Um, I think like there's no real big plan. Like we kind of know our our. I guess our strategy, like we know how we race, that we're not gonna, we're not gonna necessarily be ahead off the start. So we kind of just trust that through the middle, you know, everything we practice in training is gonna pay off. And we usually come uh, catch up on the fast starting crews through the middle, and then we can put in a good sprint at the end if we need to. Yeah. So um, there has, there's not too much communication. I would, you know give a little shout of encouragement like a, let's go or something like that yeah. <laughs> um when we're coming through but like that to be honest that's more to just get me going yeah. than any like proper communication um yeah yeah so, so there's, there's no like designated kind of captain that it maybe you know like makes the calls like if you're if you're kind of going all out at a certain moment like it's not you or Paul makes the call it's just kind of what feels right in the moment is it yeah yeah to be yeah. honest um say during the Olympic final uh Paul said uh I think Paul said in an interview once that I said go like really early or something but uh that was just that was just me kind of g myself up you know we were coming <laughs> back on the Germans and I was like yeah come on let's go so like it's it's not really a tactical thing i guess uh it's just yeah it's a bit of encouragement yeah yeah so i've never actually been out on the water and like that i've only ever used a roll machine in the gym and i just oh geez four or five minutes like i'm absolutely shot to bits so i can only imagine how physically brutal it is but i can imagine it's very mentally demanding then as well so just from a mental point of view then have you personally worked with sports psychologists throughout your career at any stage um yeah so kind of I think the first time I spoke to Kay Kirby she's our sports psychologist at Sport Ireland um was maybe I think mid-lockdown like I hadn't really hadn't really explored it before that I guess Mm. um yeah it was something different I think it's definitely helped over the past year I just don't think uh, before that, it w- I was still, you know, I was still really young. So you're still like figuring out the sport and figuring out what works for you. And I think in the early stages, it's it's quite easy to see like what's working and what's not working. Yeah. And then when you get into the, you know, when you get a bit older and it's nitty gritty, like things change. And I think you can definitely make big big gains mentally um because you've done it one way for so long that it's actually good to like change it up and see if a different approach might work say during lockdown um i just i just was getting so bored of the the training and you know, it was a bit monotonous because obviously we were on the wrong machine the whole time and Jake was injured. So I was just like doing it all myself. Um, so even then it was just nice to like chat to someone and say, okay, well, that's normal. <laughs> and yeah. kind of made a plan from there. See, I'm really into like planning and like sticking to the plan and being able to tick boxes. So even just like making a plan of what I'm going to do training wise but like mentally as well to to prepare for um I think after lockdown we had a few trials and then I went to the Europeans in the single so like it was nice to approach that differently as well because I never really gone into a race thinking okay I'm gonna try think about this or like approach it in a 
in that kind of like mental way I would kind of just go in and be stressed and hope for the best yeah so that's what I was going to ask you about next you know going into a race on race day you know would you be the type to feel the, those anxieties and nerves before a race and obviously you've said you spoke to Kate Kirby there so have you put maybe things have you put certain things in place now to help control your emotions on race day before the event um yeah you know I think I was never really that bad before but I definitely would would get like stressed about the outcome mm. and kind of would just be you know what's that word catastrophizing or whatever where you're like thinking of the worst case scenario yeah. um and just kind of like motivating myself that way being like oh well you gotta cop on now or else this is gonna happen it's gonna be terrible and the whole world's gonna end but <laughs> which like it worked yeah like in some cases i was getting good results like we won the world champs but i think probably not the most sustainable thing or like the best way of approaching it you know like i could definitely see this year um i was like approaching things in a much calmer way and like it just made the experience more enjoyable like I, I actually loved going out and doing the races because, um, you know, I didn't have that stress and I wasn't thinking about the worst case scenarios. So yeah. I definitely think that helped, yeah. So what what kind of focus would you put on your thoughts now before a race? Would you be, would you maybe even avoid thinking about the race up until pretty close before? Like are you almost at times trying to distract yourself or if, if negative thoughts come into your mind, have you put steps in place where you maybe flip how you're, just basically try to flip what you're actually thinking about in those moments just put more conscious thought into what you're actually thinking about yeah so for me um like the main focus of all the races this year has just been like the process of um you know doing the race and getting to the race so it would be okay i'd wake up and I'd check my weight and see how much we have to sweat down because we have to weigh in. So like, I'd just be thinking about what I need to do in that like specific moment rather yeah. than like thinking ahead to, oh, the race is going to be so hard or it's going to be really painful or we're going to lose, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd just be thinking, okay, well, I need to lose 700 grams. So get your clothes on, get on the bike or get in the bath, sweat down, check your weight go to the course, weigh in, like just getting those yeah. steps done. And then like in my warm up as well, just thinking about, um, you know, I do a bit of like a little stretchy activation land warm up before I go in the water. So just like going through those movements and going through those motions and then putting the boat on the water, putting the blades in, just literally just thinking about what I'm doing in that exact yeah. second. And then, when you're on the start line, it's, it's kind of too late so you have to just go and get it done then. So have to pull like a dog, isn't that what your man said? <laughs> Paul O'Donovan said that in the last, the last Olympics. In 16, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, in terms of, you mentioned the weigh-ins there, so in terms of the actual weight, your, your light weight, so what what is that in terms of kilograms? Um, so we have to average 70 kilograms. So the two of us, have to average 70 so usually paul would be around 71 and i'd be 69 so okay. that's how that works and how long before the actual start of the race do you have to weigh in two hours really i mean you think of a weight covering sport obviously you think of like co combat sport like boxing or mma so those people have you know 24 more but 30 hours to rehydrate after so that's why they do massive weight cuts because they have the time you don't have the time there so you probably need to live pretty much around yeah. not, not far above 70 do you yeah so during the winter we probably would be a bit above 70 but then definitely coming into race season you wouldn't want to be more than like one or two kilos over i guess yeah yeah and um, you were mentioned there a couple of minutes ago just about keeping your thoughts on the actual moment that's before the race when you're actually racing so during the race you obviously hear a lot of athletes saying how they like at times your minds can go to the result and the end outcome and obviously it's not probably the greatest way to be thinking in the moment i could imagine rowan probably isn't the type of thing where you'd want to be thinking about the end because it's probably so far away and you're probably already knackered so like what are your thoughts like during a race like is it just pretty much 
literally on the next poll? Yeah, um, I think I've always been pretty good at that. Like once I'm in the race, it's just yeah. focusing on like what's going on in the race, what's happening. For me, um, I just count strokes. Yeah. So it's about uh, like I know it's it's about thirty strokes per two hundred fifty meters, and then it's a two k course, so it's about about two hundred forty to two hundred sixty strokes in a race. So right. I usually. Um, I usually just have a plan in my head of literally like counting every single stroke. Yeah. So is there, is there never really any tactics? Is it all just like from point A to get to point B? It's just as hard as you can. So like basically if it, it doesn't even matter who, who you're competing against, does it? Like it doesn't matter who's, who's opposite you. It's basically the tactics don't change. Yeah. Well, I think maybe in some cases they, the tactics might change, but um like you you can't affect anyone else's performance you know like and yeah. they can't affect your performance because you know it's different lanes like unless you literally go and crash into them <laughs> which you which would not be ideal then like <laughs> Funny you enough. can't yeah, yeah you can't really do anything about what anyone else is going to do so it's kind of it's kind of about getting the best out of yourself and out of your boat and yeah. hopefully that's like will be enough to win. Um, like I think that's how we approach it anyway. I think, you know, maybe it's it'll be different for other crews. I know I was talking to the German lads after, and they actually said that, um, you know, we raced them a few times during the season, and we'd always put a load of distance into them in the third five hundred. So that's like the third quarter of the race. So they said they just all their training until the Olympic final was kind of, well, not all their training, but they knew that they had to, you know, put in a good third 500 to stay yeah. with us. Yeah. So, um, like, I guess sometimes tactics does come into it, but I think we always try and just approach it from knowing what works best for us and what, you know, the best performance we can do in our, yeah. in our lane. And then hopefully it's enough. Yeah, hundred percent. So obviously you're well known this summer and for competing uh, in the Olympics with Paulo Donovan. Now, like for even for the casual rowing fans, we all know of Paulo Donovan from the previous Olympics in 2016. So when you actually get picked to compete with him, is that almost a bit surreal as well? Because he is, I suppose, like an Irish rowing legend in a way, isn't he? Were you a little bit in awe when you first actually competed with Paul? Um, yeah. Because see, we're from the same club, yeah. So like, I've been, I've been, um, you know, I've been training like around him since I was since I started really, yeah. Um, so like, we we knew each other and we we're we we're all friends. So like, it wasn't it wasn't like a big shock or anything. Um, but yeah, I remember the first race. Uh, the first race we did together was a trial, and uh, we were racing our heavyweight men's double Phil and Ronan and they beat us but it was just yeah I just hadn't had a race as I guess it's like I, can't, I don't really know how to describe it but that it was a good race anyway because yeah. like me and Jake had always been in the double before so it was just I guess it was just different you know and then and then we yeah we just um once we were selected we we started getting some really good speed and like that's when it kind of hits you like whoa this is going to be good yeah but does, does that actually just do absolute wonders for your confidence as well because you're with a guy here that you've seen get silver at the olympics only a couple of years ago and now you know you're you're rowing with him but i'm sure you're yeah you're doing every bit as good or you're holding your own so like does that does your confidence just go through the roof yeah yeah definitely um I think at first, like, I probably was a bit apprehensive mm -hmm. that I was going to, like, mess things up because <laughs> he's so good. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah such, a, such an asset to have in the boat. Like, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, he's not going to let anything bad happen. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that first year, it was, so, it was so good to have someone like Paul in the boat just to, like, you know, as you said, it does give you confidence. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Do you know when you go into the Olympics then? Because I remember pre-olympics there was a lot of talk about the irish rowers being a big medal hope i think you were fairly hotly fancied to to definitely do well 
that external expectation does that do anything to you do, you do you even pay any attention to it or is it the type of thing where you almost actively just put it out of your mind because it's it's not real you know you all you can do really is focus on your performance yeah i think like i didn't i didn't like make any conscious decision to like ignore it or anything it just mm -hmm. like wasn't really on my radar yeah like i knew like we all knew we'd have a good chance of winning because you know in the regattas during the year we were winning and yes. i think coming into olympics we'd raced we'd raced all the boats at least once and i think apart from canada um so we knew that like we'd beaten everyone before it, in the same season so we just had to like it was just a case of doing our best training and like we know we'd have a pretty good shot and then anything else is just down to luck really yeah is there a different feeling though going into the olympics because i know you, all you again all you can do is focus on your on your performance but it is the olympic game still but do you try to almost pair, pair back all that kind of glitz and glamour that comes with the olympics and just just take it as another event i remember i spoke to phil healy uh, before the olympics and she was saying how she kind of viewed it as the, just the same race different marketing but if you actually strip it all back it is she is still just doing what she always does you're just still doing what 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 you always do and what paul always does like did you feel different going into it because it, it is the olympic games it's the absolute pinnacle or like were you, were you able to uh like did, did you feel that pressure of the olympics um not the pressure like i was just really excited to be honest because you know you always dream of going to the olympics and i think like I gave myself a day of just walking around the village at the start being like holy shit like this is <laughs> happening and then it's just business as usual really like you know it's it's 2000 meters and like that's what we train for every single day so once the boat's on the water it's it's literally just another race yeah. with a you know I, the outcome means a bit more I guess but like we've trained for 2000 meters of rowing so that's what you know that's all it is really that's how i like try to approach it anyway yeah definitely and in the semi-finals i believe you you set a new world time record for the uh, lightweight double skulls so i mean that fact alone must have just you must have been bursting with confidence going into the final even just based off that fact alone but what was olympic final morning like and if you were to compare it to other big events did it just have that extra little bit of oomph about it yeah um i think i'm trying to remember that morning now because i think there's all the schedule has changed so we only had um we didn't we didn't have any recovery day between the the semi and the final really yeah so um it was just, I remember after the semi, the focus was literally just on, you know, get the recovery drink in, do the warm down, do the ice bath. Like it was really just like get ready for, for tomorrow and then have a good sleep. Yeah. So then, yeah, no, I just, I do remember waking up that day being like, this is the day, like <laughs> this is it. But yeah. it was, at that point, it was like excitement. Um, I, I always kind of have this thing in regattas so like going through the rounds just builds my confidence a bit um because the heat you know you haven't you haven't seen any of the other boats in a while and you don't know like who's done what training yeah so you kind of have a good idea after the heats like who's going fast who's not going fast so then the boats just get whittled down to the last six I guess for the final and then by the time that comes around you're just excited to like get it stuck in and get it done and I remember just thinking it was a bit weird because I literally had no nerves at all really? I was just ex I was just so excited yeah yeah smart what about when, when I usually would be quite yeah. nervous <laughs> yeah you'd imagine you would be nervous on an Olympic final day. like it doesn't get a whole lot bigger what about when when you won then you know say when when the cameras are off and you go back into the changing room like what's the first thing you and Paul do like do you just phone the mammy straight away or what or like what's the first thing you do see um i got i got um swiped away for the drug test oh. so i'm not sure what happened with uh with paul but i was uh, yeah i was just um i was just like catching up with the fam i did a little facetime and stuff 
um but it's it's kind of weird because you're just sitting there like and they're waiting for you to pee and you're just like <laughs> just won the olympics and you're just, like trying to trying to get in contact with all the family and like i think i put up a story of the medal just being like yeah there she is trying to trying to re- reply to everyone um because like the dms were just blowing up and i was getting so many texts and calls and stuff um but yeah it was it was unreal where did your family watch it like did they have kind of a party with everyone around or did they just stay close-knit just like your immediate family just watching it all nervous in the yeah beginning? i think they stayed i think they stayed at home watching it yeah because the fine i think the final might have been a bit earlier so it was like one or two yeah so they i think they just stayed up um at home and watched it yeah i think there's a there might have been a few watching it down at the rowing club as well so yeah. everyone was like dotted around really yeah do you know when, when you're in the olympic village uh in like i know you said there wasn't much time in between races but obviously from the time you land until the time you win the olympics you will have a bit of downtime won't you you probably don't want to be thinking all the time or every even like focusing too much on it. you do want to kind of relax a bit as well like i mean did you did you have anything in place there that kind of actively took your mind off of competition like did you watch a bit of like a bit of love island or anything uh i had i had solitary download on my phone and i became addicted during during that whole week and i'm still addicted now because of it uh so there's that yeah i did a bit of netflixing as well i can't remember what i was watching while i was over there um i think could have been oh, i think it was something on channel four yeah. was it was it yeah i can't remember what it was but yeah just it's kind of nice because usually we're training flat out but w- when it comes to competition like you can't nice. do that much because you don't want to be tired so you know we'd go for a session in the morning and that'd be it for the day then yeah so yeah it's just a case of like resting the legs and chilling out really when you did win the Olympics, I think I'm pretty sure this Olympics was different than usual. Like you, you couldn't hang around for a week and watch the events. They shipped you straight out, didn't they? Yeah, we had to go straight home, which and like, was, was a shame. Yeah, awful shame. Yeah, was there like a big homecoming for you then? For you, or could they even do much of a homecoming with restrictions and things like that? Yeah, no, no, um, because the restrictions were still mm. not great back then. So we had, um, like we had our families at the airport and stuff. Yeah. And um, our club in Skib hosted kind of an evening then the next day um, with Spearline. They're one of the sponsors of our club. So it was like a kind of uh, like socially distanced thing. But yeah. yeah, I think there's plans over the next few weeks. But yeah, there wasn't any like huge celebrations. I remember when I was, when we were driving home from the... So I we went through town and myself and Emily, one of the girls from the four, we got a lift home from the airport together. And there's just people kind of got wind that we were driving through the town. So they, you know, came out from the pub. I think it was like so, the <laughs> Sunday. Was it the Sunday? It was some bank holiday weekend anyway. Yeah. So it was like that. And then what was really nice was when we were, when I was driving home then from town, to to my house like all along the road all the neighbors had like come out and they had bonfires and stuff which was really cool because you know they just like they see you going there to training on the road every day and like they just know what it takes to get there so it's really nice to like like show them the medal you know 100 percent, yeah i say everyone in skibreen has had a had a hold of it have they at this stage yeah definitely i'd say the most german affected item in the town (laughs) yeah so you know like that's like the pinnacle of your career so far anyway and i suppose sometimes people think you know when you reach the absolute summit that's just it you're going to be happy you're going to be fulfilled but you do often hear about athletes talking about a massive come down after a massive high did you notice you know in the in a week or two after the olympics was there a little bit of a lull a bit like oh geez i've done it now like kind of now what do i do was there that sort of a feeling at any stage um well the few weeks after we actually had another few competitions um we had one in in henley which was great crack uh it's like one of the big rowing ones yeah um it's kind of like one to take off the bucket list so we went there and did that which was so fun and then the week after that we had our our national champs so 
it was kind of all go after so you, I didn't really get a chance to think about it really mm-hmm. and I guess then once we had our break and stuff um yeah there is a bit of a of a lull you know but I think that's just like it's natural I think everyone probably experiences it to some degree because you know like you're coming from this big event that you you know you've been planning for years everything you're you've done for the last few years is to like do it and then all of a sudden it's over and it's just like a bit of a shock I guess yeah but um yeah I think I think it'd be weird if you didn't experience something like that because it is such a big thing you know yeah, 100%. You know, now you've had a couple of competitions, you said, since the Olympics as well. Has your mindset, have you noticed any difference with your mindset going into competitions now as, you know, you're a world champion, you're, Olymp- you're an Olympic champion now as well? Because, you know, I mean, the difference between not like uh, believing something and knowing something is it's kind of subtle, but it's also massive, you know. So you may, may have always believed you were the best in the world, but now you know for a fact that you are the best in the world. So, are you just bouncing into competitions now, like almost with a bit of a swagger, like because you just know that you have, you've won the World Championships, you've won the, the Olympic Games. So has it changed your mindset in any way that you've noticed anyway? Uh, definitely not. I think <laughs> um, I'm just one of those people though, you know, I was on about like, catastrophe to whatever the word is, but like you, you're only as good as your last race really. And I think if anything, it kind of puts more stress on because there's everyone else is going to be like oh yeah I'm going to have a pop off this guy now and see if I can beat an Olympic champion <laughs> so like you you know yourself when you're well prepared and when you're not well prepared so I think I just take confidence from like knowing I've done the training and if the training's gone well then I'll be like buzzing to get going but if I'm kind of just uh winging it then yeah the confidence is definitely not all there yeah in terms of your physical training there because you were talking about your training what would your like regular week look like how many sessions are you doing and are you mainly gym based or would you be out on the water most of the time yeah uh we try we try to get on the water as much as possible um sometimes sometimes you know during the winter and stuff it's a bit windy and we just go on the rowing machine instead then but um yeah it's about we do three weight sessions a week and then around that maybe 10 to 15 rowing sessions um whether it's you know on the water or on the rowing machine sometimes a bit of um a bit of stationary bike as well that would be the main that would kind of make up the bulk of our week and you know obviously it changes from week to week yeah. Um, depending sorry, on what you, kind sorry. Of... you could you could do up to fifteen rowing sessions in one week, as well as weights on top. Yeah. Because we because we go on the water twice a day. Right. Um, yeah. Well, maybe not fifteen. Maybe fourteen or thirteen, and then a few weight sessions. Because so, if we're on the water t- twice a day and then once on Sunday, maybe yeah. in our in, you know in our in our big big weeks. Yeah. So obviously when, when you're training that much, there will come times when you need a bit of downtime. You can't kind of keep that up all year round. So after competitions, if you ever have like a week off or anything like that, how are you personally with a bit of downtime? Are you good at just relaxing and staying away from physical activity or would you be the type of, because you're so used to it, that's a, an incredible amount of physical activity you're doing every week. Would you be the type to start getting a bit, a bit of an itch for it again after a couple of days or are you good at kind of forcing yourself to relax? No, I'm probably too good at relaxing, to be honest. Like, <laughs> as soon as that season is over, I am horizontal for, <laughs> for about two weeks. And then it's just the guilt more than anything that gets you back at it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I definitely wouldn't be one to, to be running back to the, to the rowing centre. But, uh, yeah, I think... Once you go, once you go a certain amount of time without it, you realize that it is, you know, you probably are a bit addicted to it. Yeah. Um, and you have to get back. Yeah. 
hundred percent. You know, we've we've spoken a lot about your successes, obviously, like you know, your Olympic champion, all of that. We've spoken about all the achievements you've had, but I don't think you can go from like rank novice to Olympic champion without massive amounts of setbacks and competitions that you didn't win. So how are you when you do face a setback? You know, you don't you don't win. Maybe you, you perform badly or, you know, you're not happy. You didn't reach the potential that you had yourself. Would you be good at reflecting really, really honestly on the reasons why and then rectifying it? Because, you know, obviously you see that in sport. Well, like not just sport, in life as well. Like, I mean, if something goes wrong, if you can reflect on what you did yourself, you know, really, really honestly, obviously it can help you going forward. So would you kind of force yourself to have that bit of, self-reflection if things don't go well yeah yeah definitely I think um for me I'm I'm really good at at like picking out what went wrong and yeah. and like trying to fix it but sometimes I probably do get a bit too bogged down with kind of like blaming myself when it does go wrong say for example you know we were talking about when I raced the single at the Europeans yeah um like I fully thought I was going to run away with that gold medal at that regatta. But uh, looking back, like I shouldn't have approached it like that because, you know, I had a not a great lockdown, to be honest. And I hadn't been doing the training that you need to do to win a, a European championships in the single. Like I just hadn't done the training. Like I was moving, I was moving well and I was rowing really well and going fast. But that base um that base fitness just wasn't there which you can see if you watch the race like I was leading until the 1500 and then just absolutely blew up and the Norwegian guy and the Italian guy just rolled straight through me and I did well to hang on to the bronze to be honest um but um so yeah after that I kind of knew straight away well I didn't do the training so you know you can't expect to you can't expect to do well if you haven't done it. So that was definitely uh, an example. Yeah. Of, so, yeah. so would you would you be yeah. the, would you be the stubborn type then? Like, would you use that experience? Say next time you're in a European singles, that you'll take all the boxes that you maybe didn't take that time, almost just to just so you don't end up back where you are feeling how you felt on that day. Will it, will it work as a motivator almost? Um. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. Uh. Like it, it for me. It definitely takes a few weeks of just, you know, being mad at myself. And then I'll be like, oh, fuck's sake, I better do some training now. <laughs> um, but I think it, it did stand to me this year. Like, I trained like an absolute lunatic through the whole winter last year. Um, you know, probably too much, I think. Because I was just wrecked by the time Christmas train came around. And I didn't do great in some of, the, some of our testing there. Um, so that was kind of another time where I had to look and kind of improve what I was doing because I was just, you know, training hard and maybe not looking at the the recovery as much. But yeah, I think it's all learning. And I'm like, I'm still pretty young as well. I've only, I've only had um, like excluding 2020 because we only had one regatta. I've only really had two years of like rowing at senior events and senior regattas so yeah I think every every regatta I'm probably learning something new and like trying to find ways of of getting better so yeah hopefully you're only you're 24 now what age do top rowers usually you know go at the far side of their peak like what, what how many years could you keep up this level that you're at now um I'd say quite a long time like you see loads of rowers rowing into their late 30s um oh, and you know early 40s even uh you know like I said it's it's one of those sports where like the more training you do the better you're going to be so actually the older athletes do tend to be a bit quicker um sometimes just because you know they've got experience and they've just practiced the technique so often yeah and then you know obviously there are young young people doing well as well so it's just it's, it's quite individual I think yeah. But I'd like to think that I haven't reached my peak yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't say so, yeah. So you obviously have quite a few years left at it. So what would your like plans and goals be then for the future, both in Rowan and also after Rowan? Or is that just too far down the line that you haven't really thought about that yet? 
Well, um, I think the next Olympics is going to be the last. So our event, the lightweight doubles, is like the only lightweight rowing event at the Olympics. So that's actually going to be cut from the Olympic program after the next, after Paris. So we won't actually have an Olympic event. It'll, it'll only be heavyweight events after that. So um, I'll definitely have to keep, keep it up for the next years and see if we can give, give that a go. And then I'm not sure after really, maybe um, if I'm still enjoying it and I'm fast enough, I could try go heavyweight and go for another cycle but yeah i think it's a bit fair to think what what weight is heavyweight how much weight would you need to pack on to compete at that um well it depends uh it's basically just anyone who isn't a lightweight you know you can get small heavyweights and small or big heavyweights but um like we're not too far off the 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 heavyweight boats time wise so i think uh like it probably is doable, yeah. But we just have to see how we're we're feeling about the sport at that stage. Why did they get rid? Or why are they going to get rid of the lightweight? Is there a reason behind that? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's to do with like the like the numbers of like viewers and stuff that rowing brings in, and like the athlete quota, like the amount of athletes. Yeah. So I think they're bringing in in they're replacing the lightweight events with uh, coastal rowing events. So, you know, trying out a, a new Olympic sport, just seeing does it bring in a bit more viewers and money, I guess. So a bit, bit disappointing. Like, obviously, you'd love to see it continue, but I guess that's um, that's the way things are going these days. There it goes, yeah. But that was deadly. I've learned uh, so much about rowing. But just to finish up, I always ask everyone two questions at the end. So the first thing I ask is, if you could pick one athlete in the history of sport, it could be from any sport at all, whose mindset you admire the most, who would you pick and why? Um, oh, I'd have to say Paul Donovan. Like, <laughs> he, he just... He told you to say that just, probably, didn't he? <laughs> no definitely not but he's so uh he's just so like strong-willed yeah. he just knows what he needs to do and he just does it like yeah. doesn't care about what anyone else thinks just just goes and and does his thing so i definitely say he yeah he is a really good mindset when it comes to the sport yeah cool stuff and the last question then is this might this actually might be hard for you because you're still very young and you've actually achieved so much so maybe you wouldn't kind of even give you wouldn't change anything but if you're to go back to a younger version of yourself say when you started when you started off rowing at a serious level and give that younger version of yourself one piece of advice again just from that mindset perspective what would you say to a younger version of yourself um probably just not to like stress so much about stuff like it'll be fine yeah. just do it just do the training and it'll be fine it'll be fine good stuff great way to finish so thanks a million Fintan for coming on your legend so thanks a million for taking the time no worries cheers thanks for having me massive thanks this week to Fintan McCarthy for coming on to the podcast I've been very lucky since I've started the podcast to have the opportunity to speak to some top, top athletes, which has also included some top Olympians as well. But Fintan is actually the first Olympic gold medalist that I've had the opportunity to speak to on the podcast. So it was great just to hear a bit about his story from when he started off rowing in his mid-teens, competing at a high level for years, and then obviously culminating this summer, winning gold for Ireland at the Tokyo Olympics. So it was great to hear a little bit about a sport that I'm actually not very familiar with as well. I can imagine how physically demanding it is and obviously it was interesting to hear Fintan talking about how mentally demanding it can be as well and obviously the steps he puts in place to to really deal with the mental challenges that it throws up as well so a massive thanks Fintan for taking out the time to come onto the podcast and thanks everyone for listening as well and hopefully you'll be back for the next episode with a new athlete in a few weeks time cheers cheers